I want you to consider it for yourselves personally. The question is this, what beyond the basic necessities of life, physical necessities, is the most important thing to a human being? I'd submit to you that security is the most basic, most basic human need that we have. For it is when we are secure that we find ourselves set free to really live life and to do so with some abandon, to, to go ahead and charge into life rather than retreat from it. Security, true security, gives us a freedom from danger, from fear, from care. It gives us a sense of certainty and a strong and abiding hope. It allows us the freedom, as I mentioned, to explore life and to realize our potential as human beings, to experience fulfillment in life. I remember watching a show, I believe it was on public TV, it might have been the History Channel or Discovery, but it was one of those educational channels anyhow. It was about the construction of the Golden, Great, Golden Gate Bridge. Now during the initial construction, of that great bridge, no safety devices were employed. And we're told that 23 men fell to their deaths during the construction. For the final part of the project, however, a large net was hung beneath the work area as a safety precaution. Now at least 10 additional men fell in, or fell from the bridge, but they fell into that net and were saved from certain death. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Here's what I really found interesting. That during that latter portion of the work, the, the, the output of work increased by over 25% once the net was installed. Why is that? Because the men had security. And they had a freedom to go about the work without having to be preoccupied with their own safety. They were secure, thus free to wholeheartedly serve the project. Security is our most basic need. Not love, not human love at least, for anything other than God's love will give a false sense of security. It's one of the reasons why there's so little security for so many people, because they're looking to human relationships in order to find security. The promise of a loved one, the relationship of a good friend. They try to find their security in that rather than in the Lord. But anything other than God's love will give only a false sense of security. And it can be shaken. That security can be lost. It's, it's always in jeopardy unless that love is God's love. Acceptance may be important for some. That longing for security, though, is what prompts our desire for acceptance. Some would say, well, peace is a basic thing that we need, but peace really is an evidence that some amount of security already exists. Some would say, no, it's joy. You need joy in life. Yet joy can only truly result from a lasting security. And then there are those who, on a much more shallow level, would say, no, it's good times. It's good times, that's what we're looking for. But how? Without security. I believe that many times a preoccupation with good times is just a cover-up for lack of security. Security is what we need. And the good news today is that security, true, genuine, and lasting security, is exactly what the Christian gospel offers. The heart of the gospel message is that of the love of God lavished on us upon, or upon us through Jesus, his Son. Paul in Ephesians speaks of this love being lavished upon us. And that word lavished it speaks of, of, of just profuse giving, almost to the point of wastefulness. The prodigal son, when he squandered his living after he left home, it's the same base word that he squandered, and where it says in Ephesians 2 that God lavished his love upon us. It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? 
That's how extravagant God's love is for us. And the result of the gospel applied is security, true and lasting security for any individual who embraces it. The gospel, then, I would tell you this morning, meets our most basic need. Faith in Christ brings this to pass in an individual's life. Faith enables us to believe the message of God's love and grace. Faith will enable us to trust in Christ's saving work on our behalf at Calvary and to rest in it, to have that peace. Faith accepts the ministry of the Holy Spirit whose presence we celebrated on Pentecost Sunday just two weeks ago and continue to celebrate because he's active through word and sacrament again today to apply the truth to our hearts and lives, to bring us into that security and to build it in us. By faith, we gain the security that we both want and need. That's why Paul can say as he does in Romans 5, beginning at verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace, excuse me, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Now, that being said, accepting the gospel for oneself does not mean that life will become a carefree, gala experience. We still experience trials, tribulations, some of them serious. There are those who would oppose us spiritually and who would seek to undermine our faith and thereby destroy the sense of security that God so graciously and lovingly offers us. Martin Luther saw three great enemies of the soul, three forces, if you will, bent on destroying our faith and stealing our security. The first is the devil, secondly, the world, and finally, our own nature, fallen nature, our own flesh. Each of these is bent on destroying any real security that God gives us. Satan wants to confuse us. Satan wants to undermine our assurance in the finished work of Jesus. Satan wants to get our focus off of the gospel and onto ourselves. The, the, the world wants to entice us with those things that are basically just glitter and not substance. And yet, to, it, it, it's like a lure to a fish. That <laughs> we, we, we're tempted to take the bait and to settle for so much less than what God has for us, and in that process, losing again, forfeiting, giving up the security that God gives us. Even our own flesh, our own fallen nature, is confused in this and easily deceived. And so we need to stand guard against these great enemies of our soul. Paul, in the text before us this morning, is intent on strengthening our faith and in reassuring us about the security that is ours in Christ so that we can successfully stand against these three great enemies of our souls. I want you to note, first of all, Paul's question in verse 31, and I want you to consider it carefully this morning. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now that's what we call a rhetorical question. You know what a rhetorical question is? It's a question that's asked, but the answer to it is so obvious that it's almost silly to ask the question. Okay? The answer is obvious. Is God for us? I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. <laughs> God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, totally unlovable, he loved us enough to send his son to die in our place. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, the world, the flesh, our own fallen nature will oppose us. But what are they compared to God? Who is anybody else compared to God? Even Satan himself. If God is for us, 
who can be against us? Again, it doesn't mean that we don't have enemies. But if God is God, and he is, then our enemies can ultimately do us no harm. They can oppose us. They can attack us. They can seek to undermine our faith and destroy us spiritually. But here's the thing. They cannot win if we remember this most basic, most important truth of all, that God, who is above all, is on our side. I'm going to say that again. Don't take this for granted. Try to focus on on what I'm saying today because this is very basic, but it is so essential for us. uh, Those that would oppose us, those forces of godlessness, cannot win if we remember this most basic, most important truth of all, that God, who is above all, is on our side. He's on my side. He took my side in sending his son to Calvary. And this answer then to this question governs all that follows in this this passage. So the real question that we need to answer then is, is God for us? And Paul proves the answer to that most important question in the very next verse. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Do you get that? Does it amaze you? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, How will he not also with him freely give us all things? And all things relates here to those spiritual and emotional needs that we have as human beings. If he gave his son for us, if Jesus was willing to go to that point of death on a cross, of suffering what you and I deserved, of bearing our shame so that we might be forgiven, brought into relationship with God, given true and lasting security and the hope for eternal life, how will he not also give us all things? Hasn't he given the biggest thing already? God so loved the world. Put your own name there in place of the world. God so loved Gary. He so loved Judy. He so loved Kurt. He so loved Richard. That he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Paul's theme is clearly and boldly proclaimed. It is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Our salvation is secure. We are secure in his love. And because of that fact, there are several basic truths that apply. First of all, We don't need to fear any accusations. Now, as Christians, we're justified. We're not yet perfected. We're still sinners, saved by grace, but we are saved. God has begun a good work in us, and he promises to be faithful until the day of Christ Jesus. But this whole process of spiritual growth that he has committed to, we also need to commit to. We call this work sanctification, and it's progressive. We grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. He would renew the image of Christ in us. But we're never perfected in this life. That's what we have to look forward to for eternity. But the Christian walk, each and every day of our lives, is significant. It is a significant journey. It is a process of transformation and of growth. Now, because we aren't perfect, we are vulnerable to accusations by our spiritual enemies. We're prone to feelings of guilt, and our our, uh, spiritual enemies would seek to exploit our vulnerability. I mean, Satan would come to us in in our aloneness, if you will, and ask, how could you do what you just did? How could any Christian do such a thing? I mean, how can you call yourself a Christian when you think or you do or you say such a thing? Well, you're no better than, put all the names you want to, 
Now he's gotten your focus off of Jesus, onto yourself, and to those around you. Such accusations can cut deeply, and they can cause us to doubt our standing with God, where we begin to wonder, am I really a Christian? I mean, to do this that I've done, to think what I've thought, to say what I said, am I really a Christian? And could he still love me? Am I still his child, or am I just kidding myself? But look again at verses 32 through 34. God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Do you realize what he's saying here? God's love is a complete love, a love that showed its completeness, its perfection, when he sent his son to Calvary. He's the one who has chosen you and me to be his children, and he does so in Jesus, not because... I'm particularly good, not because you're a handsome devil or whatever, not because you're smarter than 87% of the people around you, no. It's because he chose to love us, and he expressed that love in the ultimate and in the unchanging way by sending his son to, to the cross. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, How will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's really another rhetorical question, isn't it? After having sent his son to the cross, after Jesus sweat drops of blood in the garden asking if there is any way to have this cup passed from him, and God answered, no, there isn't. So Jesus went to the cross after having gone through all that he went through, after having given all that he gave, would God change his mind And somewhere in about 1997? You know what? I changed my mind. It's not all about the cross. Now it's about you. It's about how you can do. It's about what you can give. If I gave my son for you, I'll guarantee you that would be the lasting standard for the demonstration of love. And I would never change my mind about it. And neither has God, friends. The cross is the world's most real reality. It stands for all time as the ultimate judgment of God against sin and as the ultimate expression of God's love for mankind, for you and for me. And if he didn't spare his son but gave him up for us, would he ever change his mind? Change the standard? No. He will also continue to freely or graciously give us all things. And he has. He's he's given us his word He's given us his Holy Spirit to live within us. He's given us the sacraments. He's given us prayer. He's given us the privilege of worshiping him. He's given us the opportunity for fellowship. He's given us the opportunity to serve him. All of these things he continues to freely give us through Christ. Secondly, he asks, who is the one who condemns? Well, Satan can accuse, and he will attempt to deceive us. But here's the thing, he cannot condemn us because he isn't our judge, only God is. Oh, we could believe the lie, but he is not the one who condemns. He is not the judge, only God is the judge. And he would judge us through the finished work of Jesus. Jesus Christ, it's he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who's at the right hand of God and who also intercedes for us. Wasn't it enough that he went to the cross in your place and mine? Well, in a sense, yes, but in another very real sense, no. Look what God or Paul adds here as the Spirit of God inspires him to write. Jesus not only gave his life for us, 
But now that he's ascended to heaven, he's, he's there at the right hand of God advocating for us. He is the one interceding for us. I think of what John writes in John, 1 John 2, verse 1. He says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Have any of you ever read any works by a man named Watchman Nee? He's probably not very popular anymore. When I was a younger Christian, his writings were kind of in vogue, I suppose. I remember in one of his books, Watchman Nee told about a new convert who came into deep distress, or came in deep distress to see him. He exclaimed to Nee, no matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to my Lord. I think I'm losing my salvation. And he responded, Do you see this dog here? He's my dog. He's house trained. He never makes a mess. He's obedient. He is a pure delight to me. Now out in the kitchen, I have a son, a baby son. He's a mess. He makes a mess throwing his food around. He fouls his clothes. He is a total mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. If you take nothing else from this message today, take that illustration with you. We are his children through the finished work of Jesus. And he chooses us because he chooses us. We may be a mess, but you are Jesus Christ's heir because it is for you that he died. We are Christ's heirs not through our perfection, but by means of his grace. So the secret, the key in all of this is to look to Jesus and not to ourselves. And as we do, then we need fear, no accusation. Secondly, we need fear, no persecution. Every Christian will face affliction in one form or another. Some of us face more of it, some of us face less of it. Sometimes we face it because of something that we've said or done. Sometimes we face it simply because we are Christians, and people who don't like Christ won't like us either. Sometimes we may not even be able to find an apparent reason for some of the things that we go through. But here's the thing. God's love for us never changes. Our circumstances changes, but his, or change, but his love never changes. And he can use even our difficulties for our good. All oh, the enemies of our soul will point to our afflictions and declare that God has abandoned us that he no longer cares about us, or that he's unable to do anything for us. Where's your God now? How could you be in this predicament? Why doesn't he save you? Hey, if he truly, truly loved you, would he allow you to suffer so? But remember, remember this, my friends, that the enemies of Jesus likewise mocked him at the cross. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants and it convinced them when Jesus died that the Father had abandoned him. Had the Father abandoned him? Not in the least. Jesus was paying for your sins and mine. He was abandoned by the Father temporarily. And yet at the end of that experience, he could once again say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and cry out with a loud voice, It is finished. And it was all that's necessary for your salvation and mine finished. Jesus was abandoned by God, forsaken by his Father, allowed to die, yet the Father let Jesus suffer so that you and I don't have to to that extent. Because Jesus was forsaken by the Father, we need never be. Jesus bore all the shame, all of the reproach, reproach of our sins that we might live in the love of God forever. And we have God's word on this. In Hebrews 13, 5, the Lord himself declares, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. 
And as I preached last Sunday on the Great Commission from Matthew 28, let, remind, let me remind you of Jesus' final statement to the apostles, and it is to you and to me too. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And one more thing. In times or events of suffering, we have an opportunity, an opportunity for deeper fellowship with Christ and an opportunity to more closely identify with him. In Acts 5, 41, we read of the disciples that they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And Paul expresses his desire for that fellowship deepened through the experience of difficulty in Philippians 3.10 when he writes, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Friends, we are secure. We have Christ's promise that his love will lead us through every tribulation into the very kingdom of God. Paul says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in all these things, then, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Our salvation is certain, so we need fear no foe. I am convinced that none of these things, nothing in all of creation can separate me, can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even death itself can separate us from the love of God. Christ arose. He was delivered for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Romans 4.25 He gave a foretaste of his power when he spoke to Mary and Martha and declared, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then he went to the tomb of Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days, and brought him to life, brought him to life with a word. We need fear nothing in this life. The old Concordia hymnal, had a version or translation of a mighty fortress that is my favorite. I, in fact, I, I'll have to say that I was disappointed to find a different translation in the new uh, ambassador hymnal. At one point in that translation, we read, And should they in the strife take kindred goods and life, we freely let them go. They profit not the foe. With us remains the kingdom. Isn't that powerful? We freely let them go. They profit not the foe. With us remains the kingdom. And then the fourth verse from that great hymn. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let kit goods and kindred grow. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Life is so commonly viewed as the highest prize. But Christ has given new, higher life to each believer. Having once tasted of the joy of the Lord, of his love and of his forgiveness, of his indwelling presence every day, nothing else can truly satisfy. If you have tasted, then you know what I mean. And if you haven't, taste and see that the Lord is good. Our past is dealt with, and nothing in either the present nor the future can separate us from the love of God, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Only faithlessness can separate us from God's love. Don't let that happen. Trust in Christ. Trust in the gospel, not in yourself, and you'll know the truth of our text, that we are indeed secure in his love. 
Amen. Father, thank you that it is true that in the finished work of Jesus we are secure, for that was the ultimate demonstration, the ultimate expression of your love, and it was an unchangeable, unchangeable declaration. You loved us at the cross, and you continue to love us because of the cross. You continue that work of faithfulness in us. We thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to be able to clearly understand and really, truly appreciate where our real security is. It's not in the love of a husband or a wife. It's not in children. It's not in friends. It's in you, Lord Jesus. And you make all the difference. In you, in your love, we are secure. Amen.